I think you're, I think you're muted. You're muted. Oh, it's working. It is. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Devin, you're muted. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> oh, phew. Okay. Yep. All right. Hello, everyone. There we, we go. Live. We are live at last. All right. Okay. We're in orbit. Okay. Now I need to let everybody in. Just give us a second. Wonderful. Okay. 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 We're in orbit. Okay, doke. Let's see. Who are we waiting for? Natasha. Joe. Joe. Natasha. Joe. Okay. Thanks for your help, Ferris and Kyle. That was um, interesting. So uh, welcome everyone out there in uh, YouTube land. We had some technical difficulties, so we're just waiting for a couple of jurors to join us, and then we're going to start. There's Natasha. So is someone going to uh, let Tom Main know and John? Okay. That, okay. I, I think... <laughs> okay, we're ready. Can everyone hear me? And is everyone comfortable and ready to start? Yay. So um, thanks. I'm going to uh, just, Ferris, let you also be co-host just in case anything else uh, exciting happens um, or if someone needs in and I'm in the middle of multitasking. So um, first, uh, let me just say hello and welcome to SciArc Graduate Thesis Final Presentations. I am Devin Weiser and it's a pleasure to be your group leader today. Many thanks to our guest jurors, advisors, students, friends, families, and SciArc alumni for joining us today on Zoom and YouTube Live. At SciArc, graduate thesis is a two semester endeavor with thesis preparation in the spring semester, culminating in thesis reviews this week and graduation on Sunday. I want to Take a few minutes to say a warm welcome to our wonderful guest jurors today. It's great to have so many friends and colleagues who have been following our students over the past couple of years on their journey at SciArc. I would like each of you, our guests, to introduce yourselves, perhaps share your school affiliation or your practice, and note, if possible, where you're Zooming in from today. Um, we are hopefully going to be joined later by Isla Berman and Tom Main, but we'll start with Joe. It's good to see you again, Joe. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Devin. Um, my name's Joe Day and I teach at SciArc, though I think it's been a year, so <laughs> a little bit not as familiar as I might hope. Um, but I teach at SciArc and I have a practice Deegan Day design that I have not figured out how to mask out of the background yet. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, hello, Ali. How are you doing today? Thanks for joining us. Did he disappear? Oh, Ali, we'll get back to him. Natasha, are you with us? Yay. Is this a I good am. time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I'm coming to you from Los Angeles. Um, from the land of turquoise. And uh, mm -hmm. I teach at UCLA where I run the entertainment studio. Before that, I taught at SciArc. And this, some of these students I taught as well. So I'm really looking forward to watching them graduate. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, welcome also to Audrey Sato. How are you doing today, Audrey? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for um, inviting me. I'm also in Los Angeles. I am an architect. Um, I have my own practice, Sato Architects Inc., and I um, am an alumnus from Brown University in Cal Poly Pomona, and I taught there for five years, but I'm currently not teaching to focus on my practice. Thank you. We're so happy to meet you today. And also, Kaiho Yu. Kaiho, I'm really excited to see you again, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm zooming in from Vienna. 
I'm now teaching at uh, University of the Applied Arts Vienna, um, Studio Greg Lin. And before that, I taught at UCLA and SARC. I'm also a SARC um, alumni, so it's very exciting for me to see um, this year's graduate thesis. As soon as Ollie joins us, we'll also um, say hello and perhaps Tom Main and Isla will find their way over to our new Zoom link uh, later on. Um, so today we have uh, four presentations and two of them are teams. I've dropped the schedule into the chat. Uh, first, we have Lindsay and Ju Chang and they're advised by myself and Hao Zhang, who is advised by Peter Testa. We'll hopefully take a little break after that. Then uh, Wenzi, advised by John Enright, and we'll wrap up with Shin and Yu Ting, advised by Peter Testa and myself. So I think most of the students have prepared a 10 to 15 minute keynote presentation with links to Miro boards, Vimeo videos, and websites, which they will share in the chat with you when they present. There's probably gonna be about a half an hour or so for conversation afterward. But before we get started, I also want to thank all the students for their hard work and contribution over the years to SciArc, to architectural discourse, their architectural discourse and for being a part of this truly memorable summer grad thesis. I also want to thank the advisors, Peter Testa and John Enright. John will be joining us around three o'clock. And a special thanks to our cultural advisor, Marika Trotter, who has been advising this group of students from thesis prep way back months ago in the building all the way through today. So we also wanna send out a thank you to the graduate thesis coordinator, Florencia Pita and graduate programs chair, Elena Manfredini for a very eventful summer. And of course, Hernan Diaz Alonso, our SIARC director. So uh, we'll begin with Lindsay Ai and Ju Ching Hung. And I wanna just make sure that I'm able to share the screen with them so they can turn on the sound. Okay, Lindsay Ju Chang. Hi. Hi. We'll be sharing the screen in a second. Yeah. So. Oh. Um, hold on, I need to make sure I actually turn the sound down. Um, can you all see our screen? Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. And my name is uh, Lindsay. I'm Zhu Chen. And our advisor is um, Deborah Weiser. Um, our thesis title is New digs. Dig, apart, apart from its original meaning, removing earth, which is a traditional way of thinking about the beginning of the construction of a house. It also means, according to Urban Dictionary, a home, place of residence. This thesis is about two subjects, digitality and materiality. So before we start, we would like to talk a bit about our thoughts about that. First, there is a tendency to have the shape prior to materials in the digital world. If you, if you open any mainstream 3D software, there will be tons of functions dedicated to making any geometries. Materials are just considered secondary as images applied on the surface. On the other hand, while architects acknowledge materials in different ways, most of them ag agree that physical materials are considered existing resources really invent them, you choose from a pool of existing materials. We already have the shape. We have this expectation that digital design hardly has any contribution to the invention of materials. And the goal of our thesis is to flip expectations on both ends. Our thesis begins in computational space and we rethink how a design typically will come about and in a specific terms, how we understand materials in the digital. The way that we reconsider this is that we presume we need some digital material before we need a shape, or at least we need them at the same time. Rather than thinking we first put a shape down and then we cover it with a texture map, this thesis is produced a series of novel computational materials. Let's 
That's what we call the digital foundry, where digital materials are created without purpose. It is a material asset to be used. The videos explain their virtual fabrication process and their material behavior, how they could potentially affect the geometries. Some of the materials are relatively closer to what we understand as materials in the real life, while others try to play with the digitality inherited in the workflow. For instance, this material, we took a traffic cone and some basic geometries. The pattern on the object is then reinterpreted as data, as vertex color information, and redistributed in a new material through simulation. Those materials transform their state, as you can see here, by manipulating the dials. Tuning them, we can create a series of different material properties and effects, and know that they are three-dimensional. The intention is that they have thickness and that we've broken them down into what we call the super chunks and the micro chunks, and that those are available to us singly, individually, or in a collective interface that we will expand in a bit. At first, we name these materials based on our intuition, but then in order to really separate them from the conventional materials, we put them into this anagram generator and pick some names that are totally random and irrelevant to the material's appearance. Then we take the second step. We inverted the conventional process. We now have the available materials and then we apply shape. And we do that in several ways through modes, through Boolean operations and so forth. And this inversion, as well as the kind of transforming state of materials has now opened up for us a whole other way of thinking about the computation kind of digital foundry. And another way of thinking about compositions that doesn't start first with shape. In this specific project, we took the Arnold triplex by Frank Gehry as the starting point for the shared assets, which is, which is only for the use of this project. However, what we are trying to do for the thesis is to develop a workflow, which does not uh, necessarily always involve the Arnold D traffic. And then these shape assets are inserted into this 3D space, which we call the interface. The intention is to use this three-dimensional interface as a guide to investi investigate how materials and shape assets come together. Assets inserted into the interface will be sorted into parts. Then the parts move in a way that is controlled by the interface, like scaling, rotating, transforming, and so forth. Their movement is based on certain rules, meaning they can go on as long as we want, with no repetitive combination. Here we cut out 1,200 frames for the use of this project. And as you can see in the video, Materials interact with the parts and generate new form. This interface helps us to receive the assets in a new way and study the new possible compositions. Moments and chunk capture in this process will then be further developed into the project. In the next stage, we developed four houses with the workflow that we developed earlier. With these houses as examples, we would like to introduce the five ingredients of digital architecture. Number one, the flatness. Space and object is no longer modeled volumetrically, but designed by its materiality and shape at the same time. Shape and material are considered equal in such a design process. Number two, the- Wait, what? Material in- Image does not equal to material behavior. So material can do unexpected things. Number three, the openings. There are no separate components called windows or doors, only openings embedded in the materials. Number four, the thicker, the better. Space carved out from materials with layers creates a non-consistent thickness of facade and spatial quality. 
meaning what is exposed is not certain. Number five, the tactility. The coexistence of digitality and tactility is possible. Some of these points will be better demonstrated in the following drawing and videos. And then we decided to test this project on a site, the computer. We're aware that the materials to construct such an image really are just pixels at different resolutions or the piece of glass that your monitor is made of. However, we also believe that beyond the pixel, there is a different kind of real in the digital. This site has real properties such as lacking of scales, absence of gravity, different kinds of flatness and so on. As you can see in this image within this world, some things are more tied to what we know, like the cloud, while other times it is completely out of scale and representational, like the lapis. This image, this image allows us to rethink the relationship between physical and digital, which doesn't necessarily have to have a clear boundary in between. Rather, they can coexist in one flat world where the four houses sit in. And now we'll play a three minute video to get the best quality of this video, you can also click on the Vimeo link we just posted in the chat. So. Let's check out these new digs. Finally, there are two more things that we want to share. First, the physical. Wait, hold on, we need to stop that. First, um, the physical models of the four houses. Here are some photos um, of our final models. Um, we placed them on this drawing, which is a partially green screen background, so that we can use the models. 
in the physical shooting environment in a way that doesn't really treat the photos at the end result, but new photo assets and can be then put back into the digital environment again so that we can keep developing them. And also the drawings are now pinned up in the North Gallery and SciArc. So please check them out from outside of the school if you happen to pass by. <laughs> And so um, one last thing, we have posted all the links in the Zoom chat, um, should be here already, um, which go directly to our website, our Vimeo um, page and our mirror board. So you can watch all the videos on Vimeo. And our, um, on our website, you will also find the videos and some bonus materials. And the website is organized in the same order as our presentation. And it's divided into five sections. What you need to do is just simply scrolling down. All the videos are auto looping on the main page. But if you want to watch from the start, you can also click on these links. And under this four houses section, you can find the three 3D models um, of the houses. And they are interactive, so you can use your uh, mouse to rotate, pan, and zoom in. It does take some time to load, but it will be fun. <laughs> Um, and that was the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lindsay and Ju Cheng. I also want to just welcome Tom Main has joined us. So hi, Tom. How are you doing? Hello. Sorry you missed the beginning. We had a little switch on our Zoom site. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll just let you kind of watch some of the videos and, and jump in whenever you're whenever you feel comfortable. So um, what I thought, I, so first of all, I just want to say that this is a really fun, um, beautiful project. Um, what kept a sort of what I kept thinking about watching these videos is that you have all these remnants or um, objects within these houses that indicate that there would be some sort of person inhabiting them, but it, it feels much more like the houses themselves are what's alive and becoming some sort of creature. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, yes, we. Um, when we are designing this furniture and object and the house, we want it to have like each of them that have their own personality based on their material behavior. And like for instance, this orange house, um, when we think about the furniture inside, we think about the, uh, the temperature because um, this house is made by like a, a cheese like material that have temperature, it can potentially like mute the furniture inside. So some of the- Like the like refrigerator. Yeah, like the fridge is muting. Yes. Um, but then I think at the end of your presentation, you had said that these would get re-uploaded and morphed again. Can you talk about that in terms of the process of how this would keep evolving. Oh, are you talking about the- um, 3D model? Yeah, the yeah. physical model part. Mm -hmm. oh. I think for that part um, on one aspect, we just don't kind of don't want the um, project to be done, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have like direct relationship with the project, like the video, the final video. Um, I think for for us that the animation is um, Almost like a standalone stand product. Yes. And also this 3D model is another standalone version of our project. Right. Yeah. But they are the same. <laughs> then... Guys, you know, I think I said this to you before the last time that I saw the project, but this is such an intense, thoughtful, thorough collaboration. And it has been from the very beginning and you have pushed it so far um, and kept pushing it. And every time I see it, it's more developed, it's more thoughtful um, and it's 
more of a challenge to, I think I mentioned this before to you, but it's, it's really a challenge to a very old idea that's really been essential to architectural thinking for so long and has handicapped us in some ways. And that is what I would think of as broadly a hylomorphic idea that somehow you have to be able to put matter and form, you have to be able to put form to matter, I guess. Um, otherwise it doesn't matter. And what you've done with the digital and really taking on this opportunity that we have given our current digital tool set, as well as the, the broadened understanding of, of, of lively matter in our everyday non-digital realities, is you've, you've given us a way to make matter matter and to begin to develop form from it and with it rather than imposing form on it, a la the old platonic mode of form. And so I, I see this project as deeply disciplinary. You're right, um, Audrey, it's also very playful and very lively. And there is a kind of inanimate liveliness that also seems to me to be very contemporary. It's like those moments when we know that we're in trouble. Architects do have a tendency to start marshalling all the stuff around them to the fight. It's like, all right, we're in the middle of major catastrophic epistemic change. <laughs> and so one thing that's a very smart thing to do is to kind of bring all the tools to the table, lay them all out and try to see what can you do? What can you do? What can you do? And on, uh, so, so, so it feels very timely, but it's also really challenging to our comfortable mode of thinking about how form is made and how it develops meaning and what the limitations of, uh, of, our, of our architectural form making might be going forward. So it's, it, it very much matters. This is a thesis that matters and congratulations. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and actually I thank you Marika because I had to Google hylomorphic and um, and what a brilliant term that I've never heard of before. Um, but I think what's what's beautiful about the project, and I agree 100% with everything that Marika has just said, I think it's super articulate, um, super complex, and really, really contemporary and modern and upturning in an incredibly productive way. I went to the website and to your Miro. I think there may be something I've not yet gone to. No, I've done all of them. Um, and I think there's a really, interesting opportunity with some of that because I've written down some of the kind of, I think, phrases that you were saying in your presentation, which is so interesting and so productive. Um, I mean, you talk about these computational materials and this term alone isn't new, but the way that you've delivered it and presented it, I think is really quite fundamentally surprising. And that's a really hard thing to do at a graduate thesis or any any review to, to really uncover um, a way of talking about an idea that it's that's actually really fresh. And, and so you talk about the kind of um, exploration of material then shape, um, the composition doesn't start with shape, the interface, I think the space of the interface is a really interesting kind of idea. And then I go to the website and then, and I think you want to also look at the language and the ideas that you're delivering in this presentation and bring that into the website. Cause I think that could be like a really interesting launch for a future. I think that you have set up a beautiful kind of launch pad for your own futures. And as a kind of critical project, as a sort of material um, exploration on a whole range of levels. Like I, I would not let this be the end of an academic pursuit at SciArc. I would rather rethink it as the beginning of a joint professional career. I don't know where you are in that thinking, but for me, it's it establishes a kind of body of work and a body of thought that you have so much um, ground in front of you to go forward and explore. Um, and, I, and I think that with regard to the kind of comment on the playful, um, it, one can lose the train of thought by looking at these kind of really jubilant forms and think of it as a kind of plastic project. And it is, but it's so much deeper than the forms. And so part of, part of watching this made me think about um, there was a, a 3D printer in London, a, a sculptor who worked with a resin compounded with marble dust. And he created these really classical marble sculptures by 3D printing them. 
And so it made me think about um, the kind of materials that you're using, which here all have the aesthetic of PLA. And, and I'm starting to wonder how much of the project would transform if we start to see the kind of plasticity of materials that we don't normally think of as plastic or start to really upend what you mean by the fidgetal material. Because right now I could print all of these. Um, I have a bamboo resin compound. I have all this kind of stuff. And, and so thinking about how to like really move into an, an alternate or next level territory with the project manifesto and, and I think agenda that you've laid before you as a kind of career start um, would be how to expand on this in, in ways that allow you to, I think, move away from just pure color and pure like blind optimistic form, but also really challenging what materiality is in, a, in the kind of really real and in a way boring ways. I mean, I think yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Natasha, on the potentials of this project because I have also seen the project on its earlier stage. And I really appreciate that you guys are really focusing on just materiality at the beginning stage and use that as the agent to investigate the relationship of the digital analog. And on the, uh, on the later stage, you, you slowly unfolded um, through these kind of five ingredients and through the representation, um, the, inve the investigation of the materiality unfolded into much stronger impact to the building organization, like different layers, like a new column grid connotation, and even the motion and the forces you are showing in the, in the video clips here. I think um, at the later stage here, you are kind of um, going towards a much broader direction that made us to think about how we can rethink about uh, architecture itself through the digital medium. Like whether now when we look at the material is no longer just the physical material, it can also become a material that actually um, stores the forces or motion that would kind of interact um, with another kind of part to whole relationship or other sort of um, ontology for us to understand how things can be organized together. It's a really cleverly, cleverly, it's a very cleverly framed thesis. Am I audible? Uh, you know, just to kind of spell it out, the, the genealogy of this, and I love that you started with the Indiana apartments. Um, you know, I think, it, I was thinking that you've exactly, if the Indiana apartments give, give rise to both Greg Lynn's studies, studies with uh, studies with mill, milling and joining plastic toys, and on the other hand, the Simpsons riff on Frank Gehry, Frank Gehry world. Your your project seems to kind of pick up both both those strands and kind of cross crossbreed them in a, in a whole bunch of interesting ways. Um, but I really do. I kind of I keep wanting to go back to to the Indiana point of departure because I think. Gary's strategy of iteration in those three in those three buildings, and I think that's where he framed one of his early struggles in terms of apertures and how you avoid windows or how you kind of deal with, you know, how you deal with porosity in architecture and you know the different ways you can kind of come to terms with that. I think you've really run with in some inventive ways here. But congratulations! I I, I think uh, there they are. Um, you know, I, I think. I think some of the reason we're able to kind of pick up, you know, pick up the the breadcrumbs you're giving us to kind of make sense of of all the all the different permutations you're going through here really does have a little bit to do with that, with actually a rather traditional and convincing architectural uh, pedigree. And also just the kind of clever move to build on Joe, what you were just saying, the clever move to just take those Gary, the um, ha apartment houses and just treat them as raw thick matter in and of themselves, right? To kind of take, to take them, not as like we might've done in previous times as ready-mades, but as solids, 
um, and sliced. I always think there's that moment in the video that it looks like all of a sudden Peter Eisenman's grids have attacked Frank Gehry's houses, you know, and just the kind of brilliance of that, the, the disciplinary kind of chutzpah that you have to have to do that is, is so charming and powerful. Well, I'm, I'm so thrilled to see this all come together for Lindsay and Ju Cheng. I, I think the comments are spot on and it's, it's really fantastic that everyone got it. The, I think there's sort of two, two remarkable threads that they've put together here. So one is that they have flipped the switch on the digital, meaning that we are now starting to get to the other side, which is not just the kind of digital computational space as a remediation of things that we know in the physical, but actually starting to say, what happens when we treat the digital interface directly as the place of creative development? And I think that as a kind of um, start point or reset point is, is really amazing. And that they ask themselves a thesis question that, rather than how will I use digital space to model an idea, they said, how will I use digital space to construct or uh, design a material? And now, of course, we know, um, at least they know that I know that this is not new because Peter and I have been working with computational materials, synthetic materials that are composites for more than 20 years. But I think what is really new for the way they've presented it is that it's now opening up a space for other kinds of designed materials that are recycled and upcycled and it and it take on I think as Natasha was pointing out even incorporating other kinds of technologies into the fabrication cycle whether it's 3d printing or other kinds other kinds of uh, construction techniques so I think on the just on the kind of coming at it from the digital quad digital is fantastic and then Another term that they used very early on, which was I thought really the hook for the project was this kind of digital vernacular. And I thought that was super interesting to ask ourselves, what would that be? And I would, I'm maybe just trying to queue, queue up here if it's not too much to put you uh, into the mix, Ali, um, what your uh, maybe reaction is. I'm sorry you didn't see their, their kind of complete presentation, but just thinking of you and all the amazing work that you've done, this kind of idea of, what happens when you really think about a digital vernacular language? And is that something that is specific to computation or do you think computational space is sort of like any language? And so um, you can either go deeper under the hood or you always have this sort of superficial uh, inter interface moment. I'm just, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. You're mute, you're mute. So the brilliant, brilliant comment. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Okay, I'm done. See you later. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I think that I'm, um, I'm amazed that the two of you have been, you know, working on a project for 20 years, right? I mean, that's our intention. We all started like that. And I think that the more time I spend within this framework, the more I realize that there's certain parts of the discipline that are going to take forever to change. And you all know, you know, you both working on the, the, the hardest attributes of the discipline with which are material, right? So the material the computational material potential is fantastic. And I love, I love everything about it. Then when I get in front of a client, it goes nowhere. You know what I mean? So there's this kind of over time, it seems that the that practice has to almost bifurcate one's research intentions versus the production of the work, right? Uh, so theoretically, absolutely, I'm all within the space of the digital and how its potential is manifest 
But my now, my interests have become much more, how can I not only make this material, how can I affect the discipline, but also how does the material affect um, something that's more immediate than having to go through the legal interfaces and changing all of these sorts of issues and construction, the, the construction field, which is probably the least funded <laughs> field uh, in the world relative to making anything, right? Uh, I think it's a cars at 145 billion in their research per year, automobiles, right? Um, and you get the military at 60 billion. And I think uh, construction is in the tens of millions. So the problem of taking this space and making it material requires such an infrastructure of uh, legal conditions, etc. You know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking as a, as, uh, I, I'm speaking um, through just wanting something out in the world, you know what I mean? Um, and that's been my challenge in my entire career. So what I, what I really appreciate about what I saw in any case is um, the most abstract material condition being made disciplinary, right? That's why I think this project is very interesting for me, just by looking at those two ends of it. And I think that that's where I'm at in my career too. It's sort of how do you make a disciplinary argument with the most um, interesting potential that either you can design, create, manifest, test materially, but then bring into and then affect a particular moment within the discipline, right? So I think that this potential has, I mean, this project has all of that. And I'm very, uh, I mean, some of the, the geometries, et cetera, I mean, you know, I think they're great. They're very interesting. The representation of the way it's, you know, the, the mass of the material and how it's shifting I'm wondering, is it cut fill? Is it the same? I presume it is, right? That's kind of the material argument. Maybe that's a question I can ask the, the students, but it seems like there is, um, from going from these incredibly fluid abstract conditions into showing it more, um, you know, there's this one move within the video, which is, um, it's more Terminator or more um, Transformer, less, <laughs> less um, kind of fluid, right? Um, I think it's when the project rotates right at the end. Um, I find that moment interesting because that brings both worlds together. And there's sort of a continuity within the discourse, the discipline, the material, but then how it shapes itself and how it resolves itself within the discipline. Um, is probably that cut, you know, it's that, that change, that sudden change, um, which is kind of more discontinuous in its, in its in involvement with, within the project. So I think it's, it's interesting for me in that way because it's doing uh, both extremes uh, well, right? Anyway, those are some of my thoughts. I think, I think those are really great points and I'm, I'm very happy you brought them up. And I think that this generation of students, at least the, the ones that we've been working with this summer are quite compelled and Lindsay and Ju Chang are incredibly talented to be able to just say, we're going to cut through some See, of this that moment. red tape. Yeah. This yeah. moment, right. this moment. Yeah. Right. I, think that, I think they really, this I think they understand what you're saying. And I think, right. um, and that for, for, for all the challenges, and you laid it out um, clearly, um, but for all the challenges, I think, I think there's a kind of, um, there's something at stake for them. And it's, it's worth the effort to push through, not just on a theoretical side, but now because of climate change is urgent because of how we treat the materials, how we think about, um, recycling these materials and representing them that um, they're, I think they're really committed to 
trying to push that discourse forward, both theoretically, but also practically. And I, I have every confidence there. If anyone's going to do it, these two are um, oh, very, great. very, very po poised to do that. And um, just w one other thought, though, that uh, I, I think you're making some really uh, essential points and that I'm happy to tell you that uh, Peter and I are also working to respond to some of those questions through uh, new kinds of interfaces that will potentially either bypass or swerve around or um, make uh, a kind of a, uh, access to the construction industry in another way. So yeah. um, I, I, I think all this is on the table. There's an enormous amount of work to be done. And I, I just wanna really congratulate Lindsay and Ju Chang for, for you know, diving into such the kind of double challenge of the digital side. And, and in a way it, it's very real to them and very real um, to try to address these concerns. Yeah, great. You no, know, I really ag agree with all of those points and especially speaking to your comment just now, Devon, about uh, the effects of this kind of thinking as well on the construction industry. It's hugely um, interesting and productive right now. Um, and I've only seen, you know, as you know, a few of your, uh, I think both your and Peter's like digital student, <laughs> you know, the student projects. Um, I've seen a few terms of them, but not that many. So I don't know the full legacy, but for me, I think this one really champions that project of the fidgetal in a way that's so much about the research and about the potential, again, to go back to Marika's teaching of the hylomorphism, which I so appreciate, um, of that potential in both the form and for me very much um, in terms of the potential for Lindsay and Ju Cheng's future practice, uh, which I really want to kind of bang on about because I think they, they I think with this, have a really um, productive question to work on for a very long time. And so what's interesting to me in particular about the presentation, about what you've said and what you've delivered um, is that the presentation visually is filled with forms, but the forms really do operate as examples of the question at large of the digital foundry, mm -hmm. great title by the way, um, and materials potential and the unspoken, what was never really mentioned, the unspoken desires of design. Um, you know, and I think all of those questions together, along with what Devin was just talking about, the kind of potentials in the construction industry start to open up a huge field of research that I think you really only started to unpack or reveal. Um, but I think certainly with the thesis you've laid out, laid out have like just unbelievably, I think, cleared the way forward. Sorry, I just yeah, have I, a quick question. Um, Devin, you mentioned that this is a recycle. This is based on recyclable material, and that's where that uh, jet stream comes. Is that correct? Is that? I mean, sorry, I didn't hear that. Would, would you like to? Would you like? I to walked in it? right at the end. So Let's, no, it's just a question. We we could say yes to that. I mean, I think okay, that's right. that's what I imagine. Ultimately, this is the direction okay. this is going. So. Um, of course, there, you know, we can get into the kind of realism again of, of, of using these upcycled materials, but I'm, I'm extremely interested in that topic. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's obviously enough material on the planet that we can just keep representing that. Uh, of course, whether or not the codes and the regulations will allow for that to happen, it's always a, uh, a challenge, um, but I'm again, like I'm saying, I think uh, these students and there are several other students that are, you know, really, really um, talented, and I think will persevere. That they they feel this is something that's uh, worth worth making a commitment to, and I think the more people that make the commitment to changing the construction and uh, changing the material palette, um, even changing what we think of as a material and how those materials are named, we'll, we'll um, see a, a lot of new development in, in mm, practice out great. of that. It's like a refresh for them. Yeah. It's a refresh and they, they, they deserve it. They're, they really are putting out for that. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to support them um, in this conversation. I'm, of course, uh, we're 15 minutes behind. We're right on schedule SciArc time. We're 15 minutes behind, hmm. um, but uh, we're at least all together. We're all yeah. online. We're on the right Zoom link. We're, we're live. It's all going really well. So um, I think we'll just wrap up and put a pin in Lindsay and do Cheng's I conversation. Just I just want to give uh, congratulations <laughs> to Lindsay and Zhu Cheng. 
And to echo also Natasha's, everyone's points, I think that this is a really remarkable piece of work, really incredible thesis, but also the beginning of something with a really open horizon and clearly an enormous amount of commitment and passion to drive this forward. So I think Natasha's point about, you know, that this is the beginning of something and not just the end of something, I think is really what we'd like to imagine thesis that SIAR can can do and it is about is not just a disciplinary contribution, which is important, but also a professional, an opening to a new wet mo model of practice. So congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I'm just going to take a second to let John Enright in. And while that's happening, we're going to queue up for Hal. So congrats, Lindsay and Ju Chang. Beautiful, beautiful presentation. And we're going to see you soon at the Arnaldi Triplex. OK, see you. We'll yeah, see we'll see you, you there. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Just give me a moment, Hal. We're we're trying to uh, work on the backside here of letting John Enright in. Um, perhaps Kyle or Ferris, if you're there, uh, I'm not able to invite John directly, and he's having trouble with the link, so. If there's anything you guys could do on your side, that would be awesome. Yeah, we'll send it out. Okay, thanks. I texted with him, but it's not working. How's everyone doing? You guys good? All right, I think, um, how are you able to share? Everything's looking good on your side. Take the screen over. We're going to um, let you start and uh, hope that John gets in soon. Okay, okay. Thank you. So first in the chat, I post my uh, mirror board and the final Vimeo videos welcome to the chat and then share my screen. Okay. Oh, hi. Well, wait. Oh. Welcome, John. John, welcome. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, I just want to introduce uh, John Enright. Uh, thank you, John, for uh, joining us. Sorry, we had a little switcheroo going on with the Zoom earlier. So um, we made formal introductions earlier, but um, if you just want to say hello to everyone. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm late to the party. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, we're going to switch over to Hao and um, just keep on going. So thanks, Hao. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hello again. Um, I'm Hao, and welcome to my thesis project. It's called Micro School Needs. So my thesis project begins from this image, a typical typology of classroom blackboard and a teacher in front of desks and chairs in a single direction, single perspective, and a single focus. Current the situation and the remote learning experience opens a new discussion about school typology. However, since we cannot go back to school for a long time, then we put ourselves in a poor situation with collective failure of imagination. Apart from the old way we already know, how can we make a breakthrough to our pedagogy space? In terms of perspective, like a single point of view, it is something literally that tied to pedagogy. The way with we are seeing develops the way and architecture space in which we are learning. This reminded me of the perspective system. 
all the digital interface tool we are using today, like Rhino, Cinema 4D, are based on the Western perspective system. No matter for the perspective view or the parallel view, everything is precisely measurable, predictable in single perspective. Is there a new model to break the system and remake our world to respond to the condition in which we find ourselves? Yes, let's jump to the Eastern way of seeing the Chinese girl painting. Those images come from the film Day on the Grand Canyon with the Emperor of China by David Hockney. He mentions some interesting techniques from the Eastern scroll painting format. First, is the scroll painting format itself. The scroll, scroll can control the edge. The people can decide the edge of the painting as they want, in wide or narrow range. And it's an endless format to some points. Second, is a multiple perspective. Since it's based on paper, the artist could create the viewpoints intersection in one frame. In the painting, two points of the perspective views can intersect in one frame. That's why we can see that both sides of the houses at the same time in the same frame. Or the different perspective views merges between the foreground and the background. Next is about scale. Long time ago, Chinese, Chinese scroll painting is not affected by the Western perspective system. So even though it has some perspective distance behind that, but the people scale keep all the same. Next is our bottle at one's knees, abundancy, and the viewer story. Because of the complex organization and the multiplicity of information, like architecture, space organization, multiple narrative scenes, everything all happen at once. People's eyes could go around it and wander around, decide where he wants to go. The last is about the cloud boundary. When they want to, want to transfer from one scene to another or from time to another time, they will use the cloud line to blur the boundary. So inspired by the new way of seeing and the current situation, we need a new model of pedagogy with multi-perspective, multi-experience community come out. Micro school, a community based on two or three family members at their backyards where the parents can solve the educations on their own, crisis on their own. Since we cannot go back to school safely so far, and we are in the post-digital world, I address those opportunities by making our spatial interface proposal, a digital micro school community based on our backyard. So this is a format example of a micro school needs application. Micro school needs is our application and the teaching tool to rethink about the relationship between multi-objects and the multi-subjects. Parents can combine the digital assets and the, and the physical object they scan from their backyards and everyday life to set a class. On the one hand, the spatial interface is created in the familiar real environment, like our backyard with nature, swimming pool, or backside of our house. On the other hand, abundance of content curriculum and objects are picked and reset by parents or children in virtual dimension. The school ingredients could be manipulated in different scale, different perspective and the composition at their backyard. Elements from nature, digital texture, resolution, scale or collapse in this spatial interface, triggering students' interest of learning, exploring, and playing. I see this as an open and imaginative guide to provoke and promote new ways of schooling. Instead, the school is a place where you will go. School becomes the things you do, the things you have to do collectively in this community. So here overall is a micro school unit all uh, displayed in the school painting format. Sometimes they are displayed in a different way to see the same thing. Sometimes they uh, shows content in different scale, different ways, like the scroll painting. Each individual scene merge in, merges into each other and blurred by the digital landscape, like the cloud line of scroll painting. Like our backstage here, all the scale, perspective, objects, and the subjects, physical and the digital texture, all happen at once. So my final format is an infinitive loop video based on this interface. 
The animation shows a new way to look at all of them together as a digital scroll painting format. The scenes could zoom in and out and swipe back and forth by the camera movement to show different scenes in fragment way. Since it's in digital space, I began to flop and drop some objects, trying to overcome fixed background, single scale or single vanishing point. It's possible to trigger a discussion. What is ground? What is background? What is a background in pictorial space? And what's the relationship between a pictorial background and the actual ground of an architecture project? This pedagogy interface brings certain flatness and gives me a specific way to see the somatic perspective, objects and subjects, strangeness and familiarness all together as a strategy to rebuild our pedagogy environment and to change the learning experience. And here is separate videos about how to show our scroll painting in the digital ways. So you can pick any one of the scenes to begin your viewer, like your eyes could wander in different place of the scroll painting. Thank you. I wonder you know, I feel like th this thesis is hovering at, and I, and I think a a in, an intentionally uncomfortable uh, middle ground or or strange space between perspectival and isometric modes of representation, and then there are kind of all the kind of two D three D aspects of the digital and you know screen space that that also kind of that also um, kind of come to bear. And it reminds me, first of all, of, of a kind of axiom of Andy Zagos that when talking about perspective, systems of perspectival rep representation are almost always more, like diagrams of perspectival systems are almost always more intriguing than what they represent. And I think um, in this case, while I, I certainly understand the allusion to the to the scroll paintings and I'm, and I'm intrigued by it, I feel like I'd almost like to see some of these views going in and out of wireframe with a kind of secondary wireframe that is the visual, that is actually the visual infrastructure or the series of infrastructures that you're that you're moving in and out of. Um, I, I feel like I feel like I'm looking at more of a kind of more more a kind of spectrum of, of example and exploration than I am a kind of systematic, systematic um, excavation of how, these, of how these systems work. And yet I, I have some faith that, that that excavation exists somewhere else in your working. Was I on mute for all of that? Probably was. <laughs> We heard you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, uh, I, I completely agree with you, Joe. I'm not, you know, are you, uh, are you familiar with this game called Roadblocks? No, I've had a lot of coaster town inflicted on me lately by my son. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Roadblocks is interesting in that, um, I mean, look, first of all, I just have a basic question, which is post digital is thrown around a lot today, but what do you actually mean for your thesis with regards to post digital? Um, you know, that's the first question I have, but I, I just want to get into this roadblock thing because it, it might give us a little bit of nuance uh, 
in a way to view this project. It, it is a way of moving around space. Um, and I think that if you look at roadblocks and you, you download the app, there are like 45 million people playing it simultaneously or something crazy, you know? So I think the initial idea of changing perception within a game or a, or a strategy of kind of, you know, thinking about space through a different perspectival or different knowledge of space is very interesting, right? Um, and what Roadblocks does with that is you, you kind of create um, a system which also dovetails an e economic system, right? It has something else. So as, for example, if you design a restaurant and that rest restaurant starts doing well and more people start coming to it, then you're able to, you know, hire more chefs and hire more waiters and build more tables and get a bigger restaurant. You know how it is? So it's, it's interesting because the everything about the scalar change in that game that happens comes from playing it more and more and you become more nuanced with how you would like to change what you see as you move through it. So the potential of putting a completely different value system on that, I find very interesting actually, right? So, I mean, you know, I just want more from this. You know, I'm, I'm left at a level where um, you know, the, the, I mean, some of the precedent studies were phenomenal in showing flatness with regards to perspectival, combining the two. Uh, the scalar difference, you've got that, this floating football, right? So, I mean, but the relationship of how you're seeing things or how you understand things are still grounded to something that I'm familiar with. Is that part of the idea, I guess I'm trying to get to the, the aspects that go beyond um, just a, sort of a manipulation of a research on different perspectival conditions. You know, and Joe, you mentioned kind of the axon versus the perspective, but even beyond that, it is, if you look at any of these Chinese paintings you showed us, as you move into the painting and you look more carefully, there's so much more detail that happens, right? There's so many more layers of information, trees that are in perspective, but then some are flattened. You know, there's so many techniques that are used in those. Um, I'm just coming from a different tact. I'm, I'm referring to uh, miniature paintings, right? I mean, I know those well. So, but the techniques used in those do change the way we perceive. And I think that this, your project is trying to do exactly the same through the scroll painting and the Chinese painting, which I find very interesting. But somehow you're reliant on objects and things that we really are very familiar with. So that tension is something I'm intrigued by. In, 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 uh, and that's not a rhetorical question. It'd be great to get an answer. <laughs> you know, Ali, I think you make a really good point about the, about the about the, Chinese, about the Chinese paintings that in a certain sense, they're basically isometric branching diagrams. And by moving, by moving stage right and obliquely, ob obliquely shallowly up page, you get competing right. storylines that are, as you pointed out, you know, the intricacy of detail and distance is played completely differently than it is in the, in the other traditions. It seems like that kind of, you know, like I, I feel like this thesis needed to kind of isolate some of the tactics of that representational medium and exploit them more, kind of more categorically. Yeah, look, I'm all for in 2020, I mean, not even 2020, uh, you know, the day I was born, I'm all for a different perspective on the Western canon of the discipline. I think it's a great idea. I think someone needs to do it, right? And I think this is an attempt. So I'm completely supportive. It's just, it's just like you were mentioning, it's caught in the space that I'm unclear of, but maybe it's on its way to something very powerful, 
right? So I really like the thesis idea. I think it just needs to get refined a little bit um, and manifest uh, in a, you know, in a, with more intention is what I would suggest. Because the basketball, the football, I mean, there's clearly an American culture, you know, the Coke bottle, all of these sort of symbols of Western culture and maybe American culture, right? Are yeah. up for grabs. And then you get kind of these cats that are out of scale, you know, <laughs> it's fascinating, but I'm just kind of, uh, you know, is this a critique? Is this a, an embellishment? Is this, you know, I, that's where I'm a little lost. But I'm all uh -huh. for the general principles of the thesis. Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. Think Thank you. Though, the, the kind of the stage one. So this to me is, is, is akin. Well, actually, this is, this is a, a common trait, a common thread, I think, with Devin and Peter's students in general. These are the beginnings of long projects. Yeah. And I think in this case, it is actually appropriate that what we're beginning with is a new way of thinking about space and seeing space. And the objects that are flying around um, are kind of secondary so far, right? So, so you're right. I, I understand what both of you are saying that you would want the kind of shallow branching diagram to keep going. You'd want to start thinking about multiple narratives through these. You'd want to start investigating also, I think, the architectural implications of, of, of um, like panning sideways, but also having to look yeah. up. Um, but it's kind of like, I think legitimately for a graduate thesis, you, he had to do this first. And now the exciting thing is that he can go on and do that second and third. In other words, it is so difficult, I think, for those of us who are trained in architecture to get out of the perspectival constraints so deeply embedded in our discipline. It is really difficult that it takes, I think, a work like this. And, you know, he has been kind of refining the way this works and the way things fly through and how things are made lively and how things are made animate, the speed with which you encounter things. Like one of the reasons I think it is a bit uncomfortable to see is because it's slightly too fast for our cognition to keep up with what we're visually being bombarded with. And I think those are quite deliberate decisions here in this thesis. And part of the reason I think it is uncomfortable and maybe even infuriating a little bit is because it's, it's, it's compelling us to get out of this incredibly strong way of seeing the world that architecture created, Brunelleschi was an architect, that architecture created and that architecture has always been bound up in. And so again, I think it's a, deep, it's a long project it's a deep and worthy investigation, and it also has some. It's also a fundamental challenge to our discipline as it has been constituted. I like the fact that it's not sort of you know using um, very uh, unfamiliar elements. I think it's important that it's using things that we know, and it's forcing us to deal with almost the detritus of our everyday realities in the middle of this isolated, strange time in our lives and to encounter them as, as things that could possibly be marshaled into action in fresh ways that we hadn't anticipated. In fact, I think that's maybe one of its most significant achievements. And about the last uh, discussion about the different culture objects, I think it is because based on the background of the story is about the redefined pedagogy space and by the scroll, the detailed technologies and since it's not just based on one designer or just one single family, it's about a big community, about different groups. So that's why I, instead of making a very harmony, the, the same concept, it should be different content inside. And it could have potential to remix by different family. It's about a mixed culture of different um, family groups or about the properties in, the, um, in our culture. I'm glad I have my big monitor that I'm, I'm like literally like I have 24 inches in here. I'm just like, it's almost blurry. I'm too close. <laughs> so um, I like your world, you know, that I haven't seen the project before, but I know how a little bit. And I also like that he has a kind of trajectory to his work 
from other studios, which is fantastic. I, I thought you were in the beginning of your description, we're going to go into a kind of heuristic or teaching kind of um, environment. And, and, you know, Ali brings up Roadblock, which I quickly kind of looked up. I didn't know what it was, but now I get it. It's a kid's game and it's a teaching tool, actually. That's how they market it. Like, you know, this is what you're going to learn, right, through this. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of like that take on the project. I understand the other disciplinary arguments about perspective and um, the Chinese paintings and uh, axonometrics and those kind of things. But I wonder, um, just to maybe shift the discussion a little bit on what what is the kind of environment? Because you you, you set it up that way as we're all in, in these kind of digital worlds and what would it be to make a teaching space? Um, and, and at that point, I wonder, is this kind of an experiment of just, these are just all the things that can happen in this kind of surreal world. Um, is it that the level of complexity makes me want to engage it? Like it is more like a game, like I can interact and I could move one of the cats and underneath is something I can discover. Or is there a surprise like in the Coke bottle is like animated or what is, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to get you to answer those questions, but I think these are the potentials of the project, certainly, in that uh, a kind of surreal environment. I'm not going to call it a game because I don't want to kind of cheapen it in a way, but like a, a creating a surreal environment which uh, creates uh, questions or wants makes someone inquisitive or demands it to be not just passively read and watched, but interacted with. And I think, I think there could be an argument for a kind of um, stimulation of the brain in a different kind of way to engage, literally. And I think that's maybe uh, apropos as we search for different ways to literally engage now, having been denied so much physical engagement. So I find it certainly within the last six months appropriate to our, to our co present condition. And here I am with my big monitor trying to literally get inside it. <laughs> so, uh, very nice. Okay. Part. Yeah, thank you, John. So uh, first in the process where I jumped from the scroll painting perspective and tactics into the, uh, the project, it have two levels. First is jump to the project micro school itself. It can be kind of like the physical part in our backyard and organization of the different communities to have a class in this specific period. And the second is I bring this backyard environment into the post-digital interface, which means first you bring some physical objects into digital world and set the class uh, for the children. But at the same time, it's about how we use the digital tool today. I think um, it's not just uh, simply bring the physical world object into the digital scenes, but also it's our inspiration and, it, and imagination about how we can reuse our backyard for the class. So I think it, it, it's not just, on the one hand, it um, have the interactive engagement that like different community could use this interface to set the class and like in the scroll painting, have a mixed community, but also it has some um, physical in, in, uh, inspiration about like how we can really put some objects in our backyard and put the things for the students in the physical world. So I think it's a double direction um, interactive things. Well, how it's a better model than the one we have right now. I'll give you that 100% hands down. I'd rather put my kid in your school than the one she's in. <laughs> That's interesting. I was talking to a friend who's admittedly, he said his uh, children are on the spectrum. And I said, how's it going? And he said, they love it. They just look at a monitor. They're distracted by actual classrooms in their learning environment. So it depends on the individual, right? Like. I mean, for some, this is a nightmare of distraction and the world is upside down. For others, it's enjoyment and uh, can get lost in it, maybe entertainment. I mean, mm. uh, the, uh, so uh, these are, you know, but it, it, what it does have is it's, it's 
complex. Like you can watch it for a few times. Like it's been looping for a lot and there's still so much going on. It's, but, but I don't know, I guess with all the freedom of this um, level, I would just ask the question like, why did you have to pick familiar things? I think that was mentioned before. Yeah, I agree with that question. I mean, just, just to pose it, like what, what, how much does it rely on the familiar and, and why? Uh, because I think this is uh, based on the project itself, it's a pedagogy tool to teach like the uh, children how to learn things and explore things. So I think the best way is to pick the everyday object we are very familiar with and play it differently in the digital space. But uh, yeah, I think this could, I think this is, um, this project offering our method to design the environment content and the environment at the same time in digital and physical space. So um, the content itself depends on the designer, but here I'm focusing on just teaching the children that are, so I use the family objects, but it depends on uh, what the consumers is and uh, how you want to use this platform to design your own content and the class. Because think, you know, the choices you made there put put your project very distinctly in a single tradition of Western representation. It's a, it's a thesis about still life. You know, all the objects from the footballs to the teacups, even to a certain degree to the texts that spin around them are more native to that specific kind of closed world of representing interiors and the objects that populate them than say landscapes or portraiture or, you know, I, I think it's interesting that the project is so bounded in that respect. And in that sense, actually very, you know, one of the differences, but not to harp on, I, I feel like we've come back to the scroll painting maybe one too many or a few too many times here, but the fact of the matter is most of those represent ex expansive, complicated landscapes where the world, the world you're, and it may have a little bit to do with the times we're living in, but the, the world you're representing is a much more intimate and to a certain extent kind of claustrophobic one that you're trying to kind of unfurl in all these different ways. I think that's a, that's a really interesting comment and all, all the comments are part of the challenges that I think um, Howe has been working on because in a way the thesis started much more disciplinary and along the lines of questioning perspective. And as he's kind of, let's say, broken through to more um, real and practical concerns around the program, it's shifted a bit to say, what might this even be as an interface, as a tool, as something a neighborhood could use? You could imagine, um, you know, many pods, many backyard pods. Um, perhaps Sayar could, you know, imagine a kind of network uh, on the iPhone of being able to say this pod is part real, part virtual, and as such, a, a teaching tool that could have objects that are familiar to whatever culture or whatever neighborhood or even whatever level um, someone is teaching to. So I think that there's a there's maybe a moment in the thesis that right now uh, is, is kind of hovering between, I'm, I, I'm going to say like a more theoretical disciplinary um, bracket. And then there's a moment in the thesis that's starting to really kind of break into entrepreneurship and app making and um, something that might be actually usable and um, enjoyable as a teaching tool for parents and, and their kids in a backyard or a neighborhood. So I feel like um, the the spark of the thesis has opened up so much territory that even if how hasn't um, kept a super strict uh, solution or a very strict kind of bracket on the initial disciplinary uh, constraints that he set up, I, I, I think that it it's opened up so many other things for him and the discussions we've had over the summer about, you know, we've, ha we've had parents here uh, on midterm and, and, and uh, other reviews that were just like, give me this app. Like I need to go and teach my child using something like this um, in which I could kind of customize. I could go into my backyard. I could draw in familiar objects to 
me or my family or my kids and also add, have these kind of add-on menus. And so just being able to, to spark such a really interesting, I think, pedagogical model is, is perhaps not the original intention of the thesis, but, but takes it somewhere um, that we all can, can really appreciate. So I, I want to just, you know, say really well done how, and um, not that we're here to kind of get into the technical side, but how completely taught himself Cinema 4D. So everything that we're seeing here was like ground up, like this is all new tools for him in terms of how he's communicating. So he, he the research side, the kind of really strong commitment to um, teaching himself something over the past three months. And on top of it, I think a, a potential app or at least, you know, like worthy of thinking about this in terms of application is, is you know, a kind of trifecta of, of pretty, pretty mm -hmm. impressive work for th three, four months. I really Devin, I have to, yeah. Sorry, I just want to say one last thing. I think, uh, absolutely, I think there's a lot of potential here. The one question I just have for how, and I think he should think about this as he graduates and, you know, actually works on this as a, as a project for probably the next five, 10 years, um, which is actually the underlying, I mean, it's a thesis if, you, if one can do that. So that's great. The one thing I have a question about, and I, it's sort of just bringing uh, sort of John and Joe's comments together in my head and I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, there's this desire to bring in an Eastern culture to reevaluate the canon of the West, of the, of the discipline in a funny way, right? Which is very Western, which I really appreciate. The question I have then is that it's still operating in, um, in symbols, right? So it's still operating uh, in sort of a semiological manner. And that's because of, you know, objects that we know, et cetera. So the combination, at least the combination of these forming sort of new, sort of like the first project, you take the old and say you take the, you know, uh, an abstract version of, of the Greg Lynn toys, tables, for example, right? Where they take objects and bring them together. So you don't really understand what the initial condition was. So you're questioning everything you're actually seeing, which moves you away from the analysis of a concept that moves into an object, right? Um, which is very Western, right? So if you look at calligraphy, in the Eastern cultures or scroll paintings as was brought up by Howe. What's fascinating to me is that even the written language of Chinese is completely different where they bring two or three different counteracting conditions together to develop a framework of what they're talking about. It's not really you know, it's not this or that. It's kind of sort of like, you know, it, it's a different way, I mean, of, of, of conversing and of thinking about things. So to me, to have pushed this to that level would have been fascinating. Anyway, uh, it's still a good project. But, but Ali, the, um, the Greg Lynn thing is interesting because Greg is an absolute translation of Mario Bellini in the 60s. And you can locate it and it has a discipline. And I would have said that what hasn't been said here <clears throat> is that several things that you concentrate on perspectival or, or, or the, the, <clears throat> the notion of perspective coming from the, the, the Eastern drawings he's showing, I just said is irrelevant, that he bailed out of that early on. And one of the larger conversations would have to do with it's very common that you start a, a thesis in quotes, a premise. And that at some point it takes um, a radical shift based on just certain intuitive impulses that led you to this thing we're looking at. You have to understand, you have to bail out of your original premise and your work now means you rewrite the thesis and you, you understand there's a reciprocity between an initial idea and the thing you're developing that challenges 
the, right, the premise. Because I would have said what's missing here, um, it's funny, I look at this and I look at the, um, the objects and the, the, the non sequitur of, of, of recognizable objects. And it leads me to think, and it's missing to me any kind of coherency, you might even say thesis finally. And then I think of a, um, a David Lynch and he's gonna use common objects, but it comes with now a connective tissue, which in his case is deeply psychological, or you think of Crusen, the photographer, ditto, right? And he'll take found things and by altering them slightly, that he can connect the non sequiturs, that he can make, that it's, there's a, some sort of a coherency that leads you to critical thinking and going back to the educational tool. Because I would question whether this is useful educationally if there isn't some clear attitude or if they are just non sequitur. They're meaning they're just random. And that, yeah. would, that would be the continued project to really, but I think number one, you'd have to be clear that you bailed out of your original one, you have a new project and you start, ex you start exploring the nature of what you got in front, what you have in front of you and um, establish the problem. It's in a way the beginning of the project, right? It's a new, it's a new, it's a new thesis, which might change again, by the way. That it's a new beginning. Or if you agree or disagree with what I'm saying about that, there has to be some notion between these non sequitur things that we can. Well, that's why I, I really appreciated well. Devin's reframe. What's that? I think when I said that's why exactly why I appreciated Devin's reframing after the presentation. I think she situated it in its own context as opposed to a context that it had long either not necessarily outgrown but deviated from. Exactly to your point and. And that's my one comment as well, because the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of this presentation, I'm watching and I'm trying to unravel how and why it connects itself to these narrative paintings because it's so object driven and the kind of accumulation driven that the narrative is not necessarily involved at all, nor does it address the issue of time or of sequence that the paintings are, are using in order to tell a story across a linear visual. And so, um, I understood the project with Devin's reframe. Um, I understood where it situates itself today. Um, and so I really appreciated that. But I think um, in terms of how to, in terms of the ways in which you want to talk about your projects in the future, like don't feel beholden to the research because sometimes you just, it, it acts as a starting point and it takes you somewhere else and that's okay. And then the project makes much more sense within its own reconstructed, reconstituted context. Um, sometimes we hold on to stuff and it's really baggage. Um, and, and I think the, the way in which Devin kind of situated the project in a way that I fully understand it as a place of potential as opposed to a kind of missed opportunity to align with non-Western forms of representation, I think is much more productive and, and I think has a lot of uh, momentum going forward. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that um, looking at this as of how do people go through this process of making choices rather than the end product of what we're looking at right now as a tool, like how does somebody decide whether they're placing in an object or a plane that's de you know, uh, defining space? Um, how does somebody decide whether the scale of that object is gonna be shrunk or you know, blown up? Like all these processes of de decision-making and then potentially collaborating on a virtual space where I think all of those sort of um, jarring conflicts are gonna happen naturally once you're collaborating with multiple people. That's like the really interesting part to me where I think if you were gonna keep moving, seeing like how this becomes a tool and seeing how this is a process for someone to figure out space and to figure out um, the, the sort of um, ideological divide between object or space or architecture or, you know, start really understanding those concepts from a very basic level in a very playful, fun way. That seems really interesting. How does the author decide the nature of the objects or the relationship of the objects if he has control of his own creative process? I would have said it's random and it's insignificant. And if it's insignificant, what is his contribution? What is he himself, I'd ask the author, what are, what are you doing? What are, how do you control the project? 
or does it matter? Can I enter and move any of these things? And is it irrelevant? And in that case, what is your role as the author? I think that's a that's a great question to to ponder. That's a great question to ponder, Tom. And I, I think what's starting to happen is there's a shift going on with the this generation of students, and they're starting to ask less about their role as a designer of a coherent final solution, and they're asking what is the role of the interface. And I actually think they're more open to chance or combinations of chance, automation, and top-down. And they're playing with all three of those models at the same time, but they're starting to ask fundamentally, not every student obviously, but I think many students that are um, now quite deep into kind of a digital discussion, they're starting to really ask, what is the role of the interface itself? And that is complicated